welcome back. We are going to continue our study on page 14 of our study notes. We are dealing with the nature of Bible prophet, prophecy and God's understanding of time and ours. And uh, we want to begin with a word of prayer, as we always should, and then uh, we'll continue our study. Father in heaven, as we continue our study, we ask for the continued presence of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to read the statement with which we ended our last session, uh, Ministry of Healing, page 479. It refers to how Jesus every day followed the Father's plan and how we can do the same. It says like this, Christ in his life on earth made no plans for himself. He accepted God's plans for him and day by day, the Father unfolded His plans. Now she speaks about us. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of His will. As we commit our ways to Him, He will direct our steps. Then the statement continues, too many, in planning for a brilliant future, make an utter failure. Let God plan for you. As a little child, trust to the guidance of him who will keep the feet of his saints. And now comes a portion of the statement that I want to dwell on in this class. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. If we could see the end from the beginning, we would not choose any other way than the way that God chose, because Father knows best. Now this last part of this statement is illustrated in the story of Joseph. God wants us to allow him to use us for the accomplishment of his purposes. However, if we refuse to follow his purpose, God will fulfill his purpose in a different way. You see, we are all important in fulfilling God's purpose, but not indispensable. That's an important point that we need to remember. We are all important in fulfilling God's purpose, but we are not indispensable. So let's illustrate the last part of the statement that I read by examining the story of Joseph. As we know, God gave Joseph two dreams. And in those dreams, basically God was telling him that his family would come and bow before him. He shared that with his father and with his brothers, and it went over like a lead balloon. They said, are you kidding? You think we're going to come and we're going to bow before you? No way. Now, God knew that Satan was going to work upon Joseph's brothers to sell him into slavery in Egypt. Did God know that that was going to happen? Of course he did. At the first, he was terrified. Joseph was terrified when he was taken to Egypt. And yet, Joseph decided that he was going to be faithful to God no matter what. He did not understand how his dreams could be fulfilled because now he was on the way to Egypt as a slave, but he said, I'm going to cooperate with God. I'm going to walk step by step with him. Ellen White comments in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 214, his soul thrilled with the high resolve to prove himself true to God. Under all circumstances, to act as became a subject of the King of Heaven. He would serve the Lord with an undivided heart. He would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude and perform every duty with fidelity. 
He came to this determination as he was seeing the tents of his father in the distance as he was being taken to Egypt. He did not have the foggiest idea how his dreams would be fulfilled, but he said, I'll trust the Lord to do it his way. Now, providentially, he entered, he ended up in the house of Potiphar. Why would he end up in Potiphar's house? Well, it was needful for him to learn the art of administration because God had a plan for him to administrate all of the goods of Egypt. And Joseph becomes such a good administrator that his lord, Potiphar, didn't worry about anything in the household except the plate of food that was before him. Joseph became an excellent administrator in the house of Potiphar. But there was another purpose why he ended up in the house of Potiphar, and that is God knew in his divine foreknowledge that Potiphar's wife was going to accuse Joseph of rape. And as a result, he was going to end up in prison. Now, when, the, when Potiphar's wife accused Joseph, Joseph could have said, man, here I'm faithful to the Lord, I'm sold as a slave. And then because I'm faithful to the, to the Lord, uh, and, I, and I don't uh, have improper sexual relations with this woman, oh, what's the use? I end up in prison. What kind of justice is there in this? But Joseph did not complain. He said, God has a plan. And I'm going to go along with the plan, even if I don't understand. Now, he needed to fine-tune his administrative skills in the prison. He was such a good administrator <laughs> that he actually became the warden of the prison. God was molding him. God was polishing him for a great task that he had in mind for him. But there was another reason why he ended up in prison, and that is he needed to meet a baker and a cupbearer. And God gave the cupbearer and the baker dreams. And Joseph interpreted the dreams, and the baker, of course, in three days was killed, but the cupbearer actually became, once again, the cupbearer of the Pharaoh. And as the cupbearer was leaving the prison, Joseph said to him, please put in a good word for me. And in gratefulness, the cupbearer forgot Joseph for two years because it wasn't time. It wasn't time. There was a time in God's calendar because God knew everything that was going to transpire and he molded events according to what he knew was going to happen. And so, two years later, God gives two dreams to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, you know, uh, calls all the experts in the kingdom, and none of them are able to explain the meaning of the dream. And then God says to the cupbearer, it's time. You remember Joseph? And so he says to Pharaoh, I know an individual who interpret the dream, and he tells the dreams, he tells him about uh, his dream and the dream of the baker. Pharaoh says, well, bring him out. And so he comes before Pharaoh, and he interprets the dreams. He says there's going to be seven years of plenty, and there's going to be seven years of famine. And so then the question is asked, you know, who is going to do this huge administrative work of storing the goods of Egypt for seven years and then decide how it can be distributed? And Pharaoh says, well, who better than the individual that interpreted my dreams? And so from a foreign slave, Joseph became, becomes the prime minister of Egypt. Do you think that Joseph is saying now uh, things are looking up? <laughs> he said, God, God is working. I'm glad I decided to follow God's way. I wouldn't have it any other way, is what Joseph is thinking. Now, I'm going to abbreviate this story. Satan caused the drought. 
And the drought became so severe that after a couple of years, the sons of Joseph, of Jacob, have to come to Egypt to get provisions because they heard that there were provisions in Egypt. And so they come before Joseph, and lo and behold, what do they do? They bow before Joseph. And Joseph says, Aha! My dreams are being fulfilled. Just, I didn't know it was going to happen this way. I'm glad that I chose to play along. I'm glad that I decided to follow God's plan, God's steps. In fact, when Joseph identified himself to his brothers, his brothers were all sad. This is when they were converted. They were, they were so sad. They said, oh, Joseph, we're sorry. And Joseph three times said, no sweat. That's not exactly the way he said it. Notice Genesis 45, 6 through 8. Three times what Joseph says. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Number one, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And, second time, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And now a third time. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father of Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. What did Joseph do? He followed God's plan. Even though he couldn't understand where the plan was leading, he believed in God's plan. Now here's something very interesting. God had given uh, Moses a dream of 400 years that Israel would be captive in Egypt. But God did not identify, by the way, that it was going to be in Egypt. He simply said that you're going to be slaves in a land that is not yours. And after the 400 years, I am going to to release you, and you're going to go back to Canaan, you're going to go back to the promised land. Now in order for that prophecy to be fulfilled, Jacob and his family had to, had to go to Egypt, right? And so by the experience of Joseph, God transplanted Jacob and his family to Egypt so that the prophecy of the 400 years could be fulfilled. By the way, did the devil know that God's plan was being fulfilled? He didn't have the foggiest idea because God did not identify where they were going to go to. But at the end of the 400 years, Satan now says, now I understand where God was going with this. Now they're in Egypt. Why do you suppose that, that Satan hardened the heart of Pharaoh to not let Israel go? Because the prophecy of the 400 years had said that after 400 years they would go back to the promised land. So the transplanting of Joseph to Egypt made it possible to fulfill the prophecy of the 400 years. Amazing. Now let me ask you this. As Joseph looked forward from the time he was being taken a slave to Egypt, could he understand what, what God was doing? No, but he decided he would follow God's plan. Now, after everything had transpired, and he looks back, can he clearly see how God's plan had developed step by step? Do you think that he would have had it any other way? Looking back, would he have it any other way? Of course he wouldn't. This is where we have this statement by Ellen White, the last part of this statement that says, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Joseph would not have had it any other way if he could see the end from the beginning. But he didn't. 
He decided to follow God's plan, and as he looked back, he says, Thank you, Lord. I wouldn't have done it any other way. So what is the key point? The key point is to follow God's plan, no matter what. Even if there are detours, even if it's difficult, we need to know that if we're walking in the light, that everything is going to work out for the honor and glory of God. Now let's take another story which is very interesting, the story of Esther. A death decree had been given against God's people. In other words, genocide was going to be committed. Yet God had a plan to deliver Israel. Do you think that God already knew that Haman was going to try and influence the king to, to kill all of Israel, to destroy all of Israel? Did God know that from eternity past? Of course he did. So is God going to act in a way to counteract what he knew was going to happen? Of course. So God had a plan, and that plan involved Esther. She had to choose whether she was going to cooperate with God's plan. If Esther refused to seize the moment, God's plan for deliverance would still be successful, but with someone else, and in some other way. God's plans know no haste and no delay. He is sovereign, and His plan will be fulfilled with us or without us. The critical question is this, will we allow him to use us, or will he have to use someone else? We are all important in fulfill the fulfillment of God's plan, but not indispensable. Notice Esther 4, verses 13 and 14. This is when the critical moment arrived, and um, Mordecai sends a message to Esther. Then Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. In other words, you're a Jew too. Don't think that because you're the queen you're going to escape. You're going to be killed too. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Was Esther indispensable? Was she indispensable? No. Was she important? Yes. But notice the text. The text says, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. In other words, God's plan is going to be fulfilled, with you or without you. But now notice. But you and your father's house will what? Will perish. And then he Mordecai says this, yet who knows? I would eliminate the who knows part. Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows whether God placed you in the palace for this? For this moment? Are you following me? And of course Esther, at the risk of her own life, because if the queen went before the king without being called, she could be killed. And what did she say? I'll go. And if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to fulfill God's plan. Was it worth it? Of course. Ellen White wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 601, Satan himself, the hidden instigator of the scheme was trying to rid the earth of those who preserve the knowledge of the true God. Now the book of Esther is one of the last books to be included in the Old Testament canon. There were three books that, that were included at the last. One of them was Song of Songs because it was too romantic. Another was Ecclesiastes because it was too pessimistic. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And Esther was one of the last ones to be included because the name of God does not appear in the book, interestingly enough. God appears to be absent from the book, at least by name. But let me ask you, as you read the story of Esther, do you know that there's a force behind history 
guiding the events of history. Yes, God is trying to tell Israel, you know, you might not see God overtly, but God is working in the background to deliver you. In other words, the working of God was as subtle as a tornado. <laughs> now let's talk about Jeremiah. When was Jeremiah chosen to be a prophet? Well, let's read Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 8. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Is that talking about God's foreknowledge? Did God foreknow that Jeremiah would be a prophet? Did he choose for Jeremiah to be a prophet? Or did he know that Jeremiah would choose to respond to God's call? It's not that God said, tough luck, you're going to be a prophet. No, no, no. God says, I call you as a prophet, and I know that you're going to accept the call. But the buck stops with Jeremiah, not with God. Are you with me? What if Jeremiah had chosen not to become a prophet? Well, God says, I can choose another one. So before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Ah, now notice Jeremiah wants to get off the hook. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And so Jeremiah accepted the call. And it was an extremely difficult time for him. They threw him in a cistern. I mean, they, they caused all sorts of problems for him. And yet, he, desi he, he desired and actually did follow God's plan. But now let me give you another example of someone whom God called, and he chose not to follow God's plan. And this is from early Seventh-day Adventist history. God called two prophets for the Seventh-day Adventist church, which wasn't really a, the church at that time, but it was a movement. God called two prophets before the great disappointment in 1844 and gave them the same message that he later gave to Ellen White after the great disappointment. One of these was William Foy. He doesn't seem really to see the importance of the call. The other was Hazen Foss, who understood very well what God intended for him. I want to read the description that it was given by Arthur White, Ellen White's grandson, about this particular episode of the calling of Hazen Foss. Sometime before the first vision was given to Ellen in December, this was December 1844, the Lord had ju given just such a vision, vision to Hazen. He had been instructed that he was to tell others what God had revealed to him. However, he felt he had been deceived in the disappointment of 1844. He knew, too, that ridicule and scorn would come to anyone who claimed to have a vision from God. So he refused to obey the promptings of God's Spirit. Again, the Lord came near to him in vision. He was instructed that if he refused to bear the message, heaven would have him give to the people. The Lord would what? Plan B, right? Hazen, if you don't do it, my will still, still going to be fulfilled. Going to lose the blessing. So if he refused to bear the message, heaven would have him give to the people, the Lord would reveal it to someone else, placing his spirit on the weakest of the weak. But Hazen still felt that he could not bear the burden and the reproach of standing before the people to present a vision of God, from God. He told the Lord that he would not do it. Then strange feelings came over him, and a voice said, You have grieved away the Spirit of the Lord. This frightened Hazen. Horrified at his own stubbornness and rebellion, he told the Lord that he would now relate the vision. He called a meeting of the Adventists for the purpose. When the people came together, he recounted his experience. 
Then he tried to tell what was shown to him, but he could not call it to mind. Even with the most concentrated effort, he could not recall a word of it. He cried out in distress, It is gone from me. I can say nothing, and the Spirit of the Lord has left me. Those who were present described the meeting as the most terrible meeting they ever were in. And now comes the key portion. As Hazen talked with Ellen that February morning in Poland, he not not Poland in Europe. There's a, this is in New England. So, in Maine, yes. As Heisen talked with Ellen that February morning in Poland, he told her that although he had not gone into the chapel where she had spoken the evening before, he had stood, out, stood outside the door and heard every word that she had said. He declared that what the Lord had shown to her had first been shown to him. But said he, I was proud. I was unreconciled to the disappointment. I murmured against God and wished myself dead. Then I felt strange feeling, a strange feeling come over me. I shall be henceforth as one dead to spiritual things. I believe the visions are taken from me and given to you. I do not refuse to obey God, for it will be at the peril of your soul. I am a lost man. You are chosen of God. Be faithful in doing your work, and the crown I might have had, you will receive. Is this a sad story or what? God called him to fulfill a plan, but he said, too difficult. Can't do it. You know, the last part of this statement the crown that I might have had, you will receive, actually comes from Revelation 3, 10 and 11. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And we end this lesson with Romans 8, verse 28. And we know, not perhaps, maybe, who knows, we know that all things, how many things? All things work together for, good. let me ask you, did all things work together for a good for Joseph? Did it look like it was good? Did it feel like it was good? No. But did everything work together for good? Yes. We know that all things work together for good to everyone in the world. No, no, no. To those who what? Who love God and those because they love God and those who are called according to His purpose. Those who love God and are willing to fulfill His purpose. Those uh, all things work together for good. So does this help us understand a little bit better about prophecy and how God operates and how many things that appear to be bad actually are good when we, in retrospect, as we look back? So let's take courage, folks. When we have problems and we have difficulties and it looks like everything is against us, let's know that when we look back, we'll say, Thank you, Lord for doing it your way. Let's not be like, San, like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next lesson, which also deals with God's foreknowledge, history, prophecy, etc., how prophecy works. We are on page 21. Jesus not only had theological battles with the Pharisees, he also had theological battles with the Sadducees. The Sadducees once tried to put Jesus between a rock and a hard place. They presented what appeared to be an insolvable dilemma. You see, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Acts 23, verses 7 through 9, the Apostle Paul uh, met a group of Sadducees, and uh, this is what it says. And when he had said this, Paul spoke about the resurrection, 
a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In other words, the Sadducees and Pharisees started fighting one another. And the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Ellen White echoes the words of Paul in the Desire of Ages, page 603. The Sadducees denied the existence of angels, the resurrection of the dead, and the doctrine of a future life with its rewards and punishments. Now, there were two reasons why the Sadducees rejected the idea of the resurrection of the dead. First, because in their mind, it was contrary to observable scientific principles. It's the same principle that liberal theologians today apply. It's called the principle of analogy. And basically the idea is, if we don't see resurrections today, we can't believe that there were resurrections in the past either. There are many theologians, liberal theologians, uh, that, that actually say, you know, we don't believe actually that there were resurrections in the Bible because we can't see them today. You see, the Sadducees believed that it was impossible for a decomposed body to come together and resurrect again. In other words, they doubted the power of God. We find in Desire of Ages 537 and 538, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, producing so-called science they had reasoned that it would be an impossibility for a dead body to be brought to life. But there was a second reason why the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, and that is because they only believed that the five books of Moses were fully inspired. And they said, we don't find the doctrine of the resurrection in the five books of Moses, so we can't accept the idea of the resurrection. R.C. Sproul wrote the following, The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, for we do not find resurrection taught explicitly in the first five books of the Bible. Yet we do find it there implicitly or by good and necessary consequence as Jesus will show in due course. In other words, the Sadducees were wrong when they said that the doctrine of the resurrection is not in the books of Moses, when you look carefully, you are going to find that the resurrection doctrine is found in the writings of Moses. So the enemies of Jesus attempted to ridicule the doctrine of the resurrection with a preposterous hypothetical case of seven brothers that married the same woman. Basically because one brother died and then according to the law of Moses, the next one had to marriage, uh, marry her to give uh, her original husband offspring. And so they presented to Jesus this preposterous hypothetical case of seven marriages. Let's read about it in Luke 20 verses 27 to 33. This is the argument of the Sadducees. Then some of the Sadducees, who deny that there is a resurrection, came to him and asked, saying, Teacher, where are they going to get their source from? From Moses, because they believed that only his books were inspired. Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife, and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her as a wife, and he died childless. Then the third took her, and in like manner the seven also. And they left no children and died. Now comes the punchline. Last of all, the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, Whose wife does she become? <laughs> they say, we gotcha. Mm, that's a gotcha question, isn't it? For all seven had her as a wife. Now Jesus responds with three reasons. Two of them are found in Matthew 22, verse 29. 
So let's read Matthew 22, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken. For two reasons now. Not knowing what? The scriptures. Which scriptures particularly? The writings of Moses, right? Whom they claim to believe in. Not knowing the scriptures. In other words, you don't understand that Moses wrote about the resurrection. And what is the second reason? The power of God. You believe that's not scientific to res to, for a resurrection to take place. You're saying that God doesn't have the power to resurrect the dead. Now Jesus responded by making three points. The first point is not mentioned specifically in Matthew, but let's go through it. Jesus answered, In the life to come, there will be no marriage, because we will be like the angels that do not marry, nor are they given in marriage. In other words, your example, Sadducees, is irrelevant because neither the seven brothers nor the woman will be married in the kingdom come. Are you following the argument? So what you're saying is irrelevant. So three reasons. Number one, no marriage in the kingdom come. Number two, you don't even understand the writings of Moses that you profess to believe in. And number three, you limit the power of God who has enough power to resurrect the dead. Now let's read in the Bible the response of Jesus. Luke 20, 34 to 38. Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age, what is this age? The, that time when they lived in, right? The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. By the way, why will there not be marriage in the kingdom come? Because the purpose of marriage will have been fulfilled. You see, Ellen White says that, and I'm making a, a detour now. Um, Ellen White uh, clearly says that the human race was a new and distinct order of being. It was the only order of being that could procreate. Because Ellen White has statements where she says that it was God's plan to repopulate heaven with those human beings who would faith, be faithful in the end. He was going to fill the places that Satan and his angels had left vacant. And so, once again here, Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age, that is the, the age to come, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are giving in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels. By the way, man was created a little lower than the angels, right? Psalm 8 says they were created a little lower than the angels. But what is God's plan? That the human race will be equal to the angels. So once again it says, uh, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So he says, no marriage in the kingdom come, so your example is irrelevant. And then he takes on their idea that they understood that the doctrine of the resurrection was not in the writings of Moses. Verse 37, but even Moses, what does he mean by the word even? Do you catch the gist? He's like, even the Moses that you believe in, he teaches the resurrection. So even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised. Now, where do we find that in the writings of Moses? Jesus is going to go to Exodus 3. Why would he go, why would he go to Exodus because if he had gone to Psalms, the Sadducees would say, we don't accept those as, as inspired. But he's going to say, you believe in Moses? Now here comes an argument from Moses. So, once again, but even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised. When he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And if you go back to Exodus chapter 3, from the burning bush, God says, I am 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But at that time, all three were dead. <laughs> so how does God say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? If they were all dead, he should have said, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now we're going to pursue this in a moment. You need to understand that time in the sight of God is different than, the, than our concept of time. So once again, even Moses in the burning, showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now listen to this. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. So Jesus is saying, in his day, Jesus is saying, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. He said it at the burning bush, right? And Jesus is taking what happened at the burning bush. He says, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For him they live. I say, now come on, pastor, what are you talking about? Let's go to the next page. I'm going to skip that paragraph because, you know, Protestants use this to say that uh, the souls of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were alive at that time, even though their bodies were in the grave. They totally missed the point. You know, I did a series. That, this is one of the topics in the series on the state of the dead that I did that are in the study notes. But I decided to include it here because it deals with, with an understanding of time from the perspective of God and time from our perspective, which is vital for us to understand what we're studying here. Uh, so let's notice here this statement from Ellen White, Desire of Ages 606. God counts the things that are not as though they were. Did you catch that? God counts the things that are not as though they were. He sees the end from the beginning and beholds the result of his work as though it were now accomplished. He sees the result of his work as if it were now accomplished. The precious dead, from Adam down to the last saint who dies, will hear the voice of the Son of God and will come forth from the grave to immortal life. God will be their God and they shall be his people. There will be a close and tender relationship between God and the risen saints. This condition, which is anticipated in his purpose, he beholds as if it were already existing. The divine, the dead, live unto him. They do not live unto us. We know that Abraham, Isaac, and they, Jacob are dead. But God lives in an eternal present. God, that's why God says, he doesn't say, I was, I will be. He says, I am. Because God lives in an eternal present. You see, for us time-bound creatures, that which has been done and that which will be done are two different things. What has been done is past, and what will be done is future. However, God is not time-bound such as we are. That which for us is potential and future for him is actual and present. For God, potentiality is actuality. That is to say, in the mind of God, things exist before they come into existence. Because when God in his mind knows what's going to happen, it's like it's happened. Because it's, there's no possibility that it's not going to happen. Are you following me or not? That's the reason why Acts 15 verse 18 says, God, that known to God, that things are known to God, from eternity are all his works. So let's go to the passage in Exodus 3 that Jesus quoted. We're going to read verse 6 and verses 13 and 14. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now let's go to verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Now, notice this profound statement from Ellen White. Now, I'm amazed at how Ellen White understood all these things. People say, she wasn't a theologian. She's good for devotional study, but not for theological study. Ellen White is extremely valuable for theological study. Her works are not only inspiring, they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And one of, the, one of the curses that we have in our church today is that we're embarrassed to use her writings. Lest my, people might say, oh, they're a cult because, you know, they have a prophet, Ellen White. That doesn't mean that in our first Bible study we're going to do like the Mormons and get people to believe that Ellen White was a prophet. No, there's a place at the end of the Bible studies to speak about the prophetic gift. Not at the beginning. You know, the first things the Mormon do, Mormons do when the two missionaries come to your house is they tell you the whole story of the Book of Mormon and Moroni and the golden plates and, you know, how Joseph Smith was a true prophet. Do you know why they do that? Because they want you to accept the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and these books that uh, Joseph Smith wrote as inspired of, as the Bible so that they can use them to teach their doctrines. We don't have to do that. The Adventist Church, we simply can teach everybody, everybody from the Bible, and then at the end we say, oh, by the way, we have an inspired commentary that teaches all these things. And then people say, oh, really? So, so she's just amplifying the Bible? I don't have a problem with that. It's only when we put her in place of the Bible that we have troubles. Now notice, Manuscript Releases, Volume 14, pages 22 and 23. I am means an eternal presence. The past, present, and future are alike to God. Are the past, present, and future all alike to us? No, to God. Now listen to this. He sees the most remote events of past history and the far distant future with as clear a vision as we do those things that are transpiring daily, God lives in an eternal present. His concept of time is different than our concept of time. God foresees the future and he molds history according to his foreknowledge. That's why Satan is at a great disadvantage in history. You know, I've compared the development of history like a game of chess. Satan is on one side of the table and Jesus is on the other. And so, and so God says to Satan, your move. And so Satan moves and God says, okay, my turn. So then God moves and Satan says, oh, I wish I knew that he was going to do that. But then he kind of maneuvers and he, and he plays that, got him. And so, okay, my turn, God says, and he moves. Oh, I wish I knew he was going to do that. How much of a chance is there that Satan can win? Listen, if you had a game of chess and you knew all of the moves that the other person was going to make, there's no chance you could lose. God knows all of the moves that Satan is going to make. And in eternity past, he developed a plan to counteract those moves. God will win. God cannot lose. Let's just make sure that we're with him. Let's be with the winner, in other words. Now, let's notice some biblical examples of the difference between God's concept of time and prophetic event, events and ours. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. Genesis 17, verses 4 and 5. Here, 
God is promising Abraham that he's going to be the father of a great poster posterity. It says there in verse 4, As for me, God is speaking, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Whose perspective of time is that? God's or ours? Ours. It's a future event. God is saying, you shall be the father of many nations. But now notice the very next verse. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Whose perspective of time is that? God's. For God, it was a done deal. For Abraham, it was future. And you say, oh, pastor, you're, you're twisting the text. Well, how about Paul? Let's see what Paul used this, these verses. Notice Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. Romans 4 and verse 17. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. That comes from Genesis, right? Genesis 17. I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the presence of God whom he believed. The God who makes what? The dead alive, which is similar to Exodus chapter 3, I might say, and summons the things that do not yet exist as though they already do. Are you catching the picture? God considers the things, according to this, according to the Apostle Paul, the things that do not exist as though they already exist. Now let's examine a couple of uh, translations, more, more recent translations. The New English translation says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the presence of God whom he believed, the God who makes the dead alive and summons the things that do not yet exist as though they already do. Notice the Weymouth translation. Thus, in the sight of God, notice, not our sight, not our concept of time, in the sight of God, in whom he, Abraham, believed, who gives life to the dead and makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did, Abraham is the forefather of all of us. As it is written, I have appointed to you, uh, appointed you to be the forefather of many nations. And then we have this comment by Albert Barnes, the great Presbyterian commentator from long ago, where he explains what the Apostle Paul meant as Paul quotes Genesis 17. That is, those things which he foretells, which God foretells, and promises are so certain that he may speak of them as already in existence. Thus, in relation to Abraham, Abraham, God, instead of simply promising that he would make him the father of many nations, speaks of it as already done. I have made thee. In his own mind or purpose, he, that is God, had so constituted him, and it was so certain that it would take place that he might speak of it as already done. Amazing, isn't it? Now let's give a biblical, another biblical example of this. And we, can, we have time just for this. When was Jesus slain? When did Jesus die? <laughs> There's division in the camp. <laughs> for us, Jesus died on a Friday, the 14th of Nisan, three o'clock in the afternoon of the year 31. It's a past event, not for God. Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse eight. Revelation 13 verse eight, speaking about those who will worship the beast. All who dwell on earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb, slain from when? from the foundation of the world. Whose perspective is that? How sure was it that Jesus was going to die on the cross? It was so certain that in the mind of God, it was an occurrence 
in eternity past. How certain can we be that prophecy will be fulfilled? How certain can we be that if we die, we're going to resurrect? I hope so. No. You can take it to the bank. Because in the mind of God, it has already happened. And at the end of this lesson, which will be in our next session, we're going to notice how this applies to Job, for example. Amazing. Now, Ellen White wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 63, the plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth. For Christ is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And in the devotional book, The Faith I Live By, page 77, she wrote, The covenant of grace is not a new truth, for it existed where? It existed in the mind of God from all eternity. This is why it is called, what kind of covenant? It is called the everlasting covenant. Notice 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Here you have God's perspective and you have our perspective. He indeed was foreordained. Jesus was foreordained when? When was the plan devised? Indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Whose perspective is that? God's. But was manifest in these last times for you. Whose perspective is that? Ours. God in eternity past, us manifest in these times. Notice Titus chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3. Titus chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised when? Before time began. Whose perspective is that? God's perspective. But has, notice we have a but here, but has when? In due time manifested. Whose perspective is that? When it actually takes place. But has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of our God, our Savior. And in our next session, we're going to notice how this resolves a, a, an apparent contradiction where the Bible says that when an individual is baptized, their name is written in the book of life. But Ellen White, sa uh, Ellen White says that, actually she says that a person is uh, written in the book of life when they're baptized, but the Bible says that it was already decided in eternity past.